there. And let's go ahead and take our Bibles this morning. Jumping right into the message already. John chapter 14 today. In your Bible, John chapter 14. New Testament there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Chapter number 14, as we mentioned earlier. We began seven weeks ago. That's all uh, many weeks we've already been on this. This is uh, week number seven. On uh, We began with defending the faith. Why do we do what we do? And if you remember that message, why, why, do, we do, why, why do we do this? Why do we live this way? Well, it's for the faith. It's for the faith of the gospel. We're striving together uh, with one purpose, one spirit, one mind. Uh, that's why we do what we do. It's for the faith. And so we began to, uh, six weeks ago, to define the faith. So what does the Bible say? We looked at our faith in God's Word. We saw our faith in God the Father, then God the Son. A few weeks ago, God the Holy Spirit. Last week, we saw our faith that saves us. Today, we're going to look a little bit more towards the future, uh, when our faith becomes sight. Uh, and then after this week, we'll finish this week with defining the faith, and we'll begin next week looking at demonstrating our faith. How do we live it out? How do we take what we know from Scripture and what we believe about these things we've looked at and, and live it out? How do we grow in it? How do we move forward? Uh, how do we share it with others? How do we steward all these different things? We'll look at demonstrating our faith in the weeks to come. Uh, sometimes when we begin to talk about future events or uh, uh, prophecy, so to speak. If you're like me, sometimes it can sound a little intimidating. It can sound a little like, oh, that's a little too much for me. I don't know if I'm going to be able to understand that. But the truth of the matter is, God's told us so much about it in His Word. And He wants us to study His Word. He wants us to move forward. And when we have a little bit of understanding of what's going on down the road, of what's coming, of what God said is next on his timetable, I believe it can do two things. It can first inspire confidence in our hearts. A child of God should have confidence in the God who created him and the God who's in control of this universe. So it'll give us confidence, but second of all, it'll motivate us to tell others about it. And we're going to see how, how that will work. Um, again, many people, many even Christians are just disinterested in this topic. But if it's something that can inspire confidence in God and motivate me to tell others, I want to know more about it. And so we're going to we're going to look at that uh, in this passage this morning, John chapter fourteen. Look at verse number one. It's a familiar passage, perhaps to some of you. The Bible says, "Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you." And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We're going to look this morning at when our faith becomes sight. When our faith becomes sight. Let's bow for prayer and ask the Lord to bless the Lord. Thank you for the, for the time we've had already to sing your praises about getting to heaven. And rolls call up yonder and, and the motivation to bring them in and rescue the perishing. And, uh, just rehearsing uh, your goodness, how you blessed uh, even here just in the last few weeks. Thank you for being so good. Now as we come and center our attention around your word, help us to listen and learn and may your spirit work. We ask you to do something great today in our hearts. We need you. We need to be more like you. Help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you recall, we looked at this passage uh, just two weeks ago. And in this, if you remember, John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is beginning to tell his disciples that he's going away. And he said, I'm going to leave, but there's still a great work for you to do. And so what I want to do is while I'm gone, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And he gives them two promises. First, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to work inside of you, and we covered all that. We looked at that. He's going to do great works in you and through you. But you notice there's a second promise that he gave, and we read it. Look down again, if you were, in verse number 3. The Bible says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I want you to read the next four words, beginning with the word I. Read them out loud together with me. Ready? Begin. I will come again. 
Let's look at it one more time. John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, read it with me out loud. I will come again. He promised them, I'm coming back. Jesus said, I will come again. And for hundreds of years, for centuries, many Christians have clung to this promise that he's coming again. And it provides hope during difficult times. It's an inspiration for every generation. But can I tell you the truth of the matter is this. As we think about the return of Christ, it's all based on faith. It's nothing we can see. It's nothing that has happened yet. And so it's just a matter of if we're going to believe it by faith. And yet, we won't turn there, but in 1 John, at the end of the Bible, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible tells us that one day our faith will become sight. And it says, we shall see him as he is. So these things that we're talking about by faith this morning, one day will become sight. One day we won't just have to imagine a thing is going to happen. We're going to see it all take place. And I want us to, to look at three perspectives on prophecy on future events this morning. That I believe will, again, twofold purpose, inspire confidence in our heart and motivate us to tell others. First of all, I want us to notice the reliability of God's promises. The reliability of God's promises. From Genesis to Revelation and the entire Bible, there are thousands, perhaps, even some have said, of prophecies. Most of which have already been fulfilled. They're, they're recorded for us to know, but also for us to be inspired. And so as we look at the reliability of God's promises, I want you to think of this. There's a focus on prophecy in God's Word. There's a focus on prophecy. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 46. Prophecy is simply uh, a foretelling of events. Uh, things that are to come. Knowing about it. Isaiah 46. And we're going to look at some verses there once you, once you get there, if you want to look back up this way. Our God, yeah, what, what's unique about it, the one true God, is the fact that He can both prophesy events, watch this, and then control and make sure they happen. He can say this is what's going to happen, and then He can make sure it happens. That's in stark contrast to false gods. Many false gods don't attempt to predict the future. There are many false prophets that do. But we're going to see uh, something unique about our God. Isaiah 46, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Remember the form of things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Watch this. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. This is what's unique about our God, the focus on prophecy. God says, not only will I prophesy of something to come, I will make sure it happens. The, there's a phrase uh, at least 120 times in the Bible, and it's this. And it shall come to pass. And it shall come to pass. Uh, if you think about uh, what we mentioned uh, in John 14 just a moment ago, Jesus says, I'm coming again. You know, all throughout Scripture, I'm sure you've seen many places. Before Christ came the first time, before he came to earth, there was prophecy about it. It was told, Jesus is coming one day. He's coming one day, and then he came. He was born of a virgin. We celebrate Christmas thinking about the birth of Christ. But of all those prophecies telling about Jesus coming, take that number, watch this, multiply it by eight. And that's how many times in Scripture that it tells about His coming a second time. It tells us so much about His second coming, that He's coming back. He's coming again. Every writer in the New Testament uh, talks about it 318 times alone in the New Testament alone doesn't talk about the second coming, that he's coming back. The promise that he gave his disciples, I will come again, we have it so often. So there's a focus 
on prophecy in God's word, but I want us to look at second of all, there's a fulfillment of prophecy in God's word. So it's not just a focus where God says this is what's going to happen, but there's a fulfillment of this is what has already happened. In, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, God warned his, his people, the nation of Israel, uh, regarding false prophets. He said, you know what? People are going to come and say, this is what's going to happen, but mark their words. He said, if it happens, they're from me. If it doesn't, they're not. God says, I am 100% accurate 100% of the time. Anything I say will come to pass. And if someone says they're from me, they're speaking a word from God, and it doesn't happen, they're not from me. By the way, people didn't just do that in the Old Testament. People are still doing that today. I'll never forget one of the biggest ones. Uh, I was I was uh, living in the Bay Area, and it was May 21st. I'll never forget the date. May 21st, Jesus is coming again. And many people went up to the mountains. Some people went out and maxed up their credit cards because the end of the world is coming. The reason I remember is May 21st because that was my birthday. I'm like, yeah, I'm celebrating Christ's return on my birthday. May 21st, I remember where I was. I was in the mall sitting down because that's what I do. I go to the mall and wait on my wife just shopping. I'm like, man, I guess now is the time to go shopping. It's the end. I'll never have to pay these bills. I don't know. Whatever. But you know what didn't happen? He didn't come again. False prophet. People still do that today. He commanded, uh, God commanded us to reject any prophets that say this is what's going to happen and it doesn't happen. Listen to these verses. In Deuteronomy 18 it says, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. If thou say in thy heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speak in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So God warns from the very beginning, really, uh, of the nation of Israel. He says, there are going to be people that say they're speaking from me. But if it doesn't come to pass, mark it down, they're not from me. Why? Because in the Bible, there's a focus on prophecy. But there's also a fulfillment of prophecy. God's word has not faltered in a wide variety of human events. We're not going to go through all of them. We're not really even going to go through any specific one. But just in general, there are many prophecies regarding Jesus Christ. There are many prophecies uh, regarding the birth of other biblical characters that have come to pass. There are prophecies in scripture relating to cities. The city of Tyre of Jericho, Nineveh. There are many regarding the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there are prophecies re re regarding and, and relating to the details of, uh, of at least 41 different Old Testament characters. Of eight New Testament characters. There are prophecies regarding nations. The nation of Israel, the nation of Egypt, of Persia, of Greece. All these things. That there are prophecies all throughout Scripture that have all been fulfilled. What are we saying? There's a reliability in God's promise. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Mark it down. Second of all, I want us to look at the revealing of God's program. This is a little bit of teaching time now. I have a little bit of preaching, a little bit of teaching now, and we'll get back to some preaching in just a moment. But we've established that God can prophesy the future. We've established that not only will He prophesy, He'll control it and be sure it comes to pass. So let's look at some prophecies that the Bible gives of what's going to happen in the future that hasn't happened yet. We know they will. This is the part where, if you're like me, sometimes it can feel a little uneasy, uh, a little intimidated, a little overwhelmed. Uh, but prophecy can be simple to understand. I want us to look at uh, a basic skeleton of eight events. You ready? This is kind of exciting. We know, based on the Bible, what's going to happen. The very next event on God's timetable. If we had a calendar of all the prophecies that God has fulfilled and the ones that are yet to be fulfilled, the very next one is the first one we're going to talk about. And it's called the rapture of believers. 
the rapture of believers. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but we're going to talk about what that means in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In fact, we're going to turn to a few places. Let's go ahead and go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What, what's God's program? What's next on the calendar? If you uh, start a school this week, undoubtedly you have a school calendar uh, that gives a list of events that are going to happen based on the date. Well, what's next on God's calendar? The first one is the rapture of believers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's in the New Testament there near the end. Verse number 15. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 15. The Bible says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This passage tells us that those who are dead in Christ have had accepted Christ and have already died, and then those who are alive and have accepted Christ are going to meet the Lord in the air one day. It's the very next event to occur on God's calendar. Watch this. It could happen today. The truth of the matter is there's nothing preventing it from happening before the service is over. It could happen this week. No man knoweth, the Bible says, that the day of the hour. But know this. Of all of God's prophecies, many have been fulfilled. The ones that have not, what's next? The rapture of all believers. Meeting the Lord in the air. Just for those who have accepted Christ. The Bible says it's going to happen. Uh, we shall all, we shall not sleep. We shall all be changed. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, not to turn there. It's going to happen in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. The trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. That's God's program, the rapture of all believers. What happens then? When all believers are raptured, something's going to happen in heaven. It's the next event. It's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ also, uh, for a period of seven years, is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. The judgment seat. Listen to these verses in 2 Corinthians 5. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that... Whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Listen to this verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. So what is the what's the judgment seat of Christ? First of all, it's only for believers. It's only for those who trust in Christ. And think of it almost like an award ceremony. Uh, maybe you have... have if, if you watch the Olympics, I think those are coming next year, the summer. What's this year? 19. Is it next year? The summer Olympics next year, yeah. I always enjoy those. And after each event, what do you have? You have a medal ceremony. Those who did well receive a prize. Uh, that's basically what the judgment seat is. It's not just rewarding for good. It's saying, uh, this is what happened and we had wrong motives. Uh, at the judgment seat of Christ is where uh, God will right all the wrongs. Where he'll settle all scores. Where he'll reveal, reveal impure motives. Where he'll correct rationalization. The judgment seat of Christ is when everything will be made right. Where people will, will see their impure motives before Christ and they'll judge them for that. Where people will be rewarded for their work. We're going to look at some verses for that in just a little bit. So this is what's happening in heaven. Alright, so we've got the rapture of all believers. When that happens, for seven years, there's a period of the judgment seat of Christ and marriage supper of the Lamb. Something else is happening at the same time down on earth. It's not something you and I want to be a part of. Again, we're saved. We're not going to be a part of this. Because we're at the judgment seat of Christ. During that seven years on earth, we have a third event, the seven years of tribulation. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. The seven years of tribulation. While Christians are enjoying their marriage in Christ in our reward ceremony at the judgment seat, there will be a, a period of time that will be uh, terrible on earth called the tribulation. Matthew 24, verse number 21. The Bible says, For then shall be great tribulation, 
such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. We're not going in detail about the tribulation. If you want to study about it, there are 11 chapters in Revelation, chapter 6 through 16, that talk about the seven years of tribulation. Uh, as God carries out his wrath on the earth, on people who have not accepted him. By the way, some people say, well, I, I'm just going to wait. If all these things happen, then I'll trust Christ. It's going to be too late then. It'll be too late. Once the rapture happens, we missed our opportunity. Today's the day. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation if we haven't trusted in Christ. So, we got the rapture. All believers in heaven, judgment seat of Christ, bear and with the Lamb. Those who didn't trust Christ, going through the seven-year tribulation, what happens next? Next, we have the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. So, this is just a little technical. Some people say, he's coming again, the second coming. There's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. And the rapture, Jesus doesn't come to earth. He comes to the clouds. He doesn't come all the way down. We meet him in the clouds. The second coming, he's coming back all the way. And we're going to talk about what he's going to do in just a moment. We're there in Matthew 24. Look in verse 29. Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So the seven years of tribulation conclude, and the Lord Jesus Christ comes with us. If we trusted Christ, we're there in seven, for seven years, the judgment seat, we're coming back to earth with Christ to rule and, and to reign. Uh, during this time, uh, foes are going to gather against Christ, and then they're going to be defeated. Satan is going to be bound, and then comes our next event. Okay, so here we are. Rapture in heaven, judgment seat on earth, tribulation. Next, Jesus comes back. Next event, the millennial reign. Millennial means a thousand years. The thousand year reign of Christ with us on earth. I saw thrones, they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. I'm going to skip down to Revelation 20, verse 4. It says this, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Jesus Christ will personally rule on this earth for a thousand years. What happens after that? This is one of the exciting parts. I mean, all of this is really exciting. Rapture, judgment seat, tribulation. Not good. End of the tribulation, Jesus comes, rules and reigns with us for a thousand years, and then comes the final judgment of Satan. Listen to these verses. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So Satan's bound. For that thousand years while Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning, Satan's bound. Incredible time. And then he's out. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So Satan is loose. He goes all around the earth trying to gather forces to go against Christ. Verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is loose, gathers people to go against God. Fire from heaven comes to destroy him. He's cast into the lake of fire to be seen and never again. The final judgment of Satan. Yeah, and we all cheer for that. Yeah, wonderful, good stuff. What happens then? At that point comes another judgment seat. Christians have appeared at the judgment seat of Christ. Next comes what the Bible calls the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is not for Christians. It's for unbelievers. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 20. To the very end of your Bible. We're almost done with the teaching time. You've done well. I hope it's not overwhelming for you. But we're going to put it all on application in just a moment. Revelation chapter 20. These verses I read, I, I read verse 4 already. That talked about the millennial kingdom. Well, we read verses 7 through 10 that talk about the final judgment of Satan. Notice verse number 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. 
And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Notice verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says all those who have died already were going to face judgment one final time. The great white throne judgment. And if you had not accepted Christ to open the book of life, your name is not there forever. They're cast into the lake of fire along with the devil and all the false prophets. This is the, the great white throne judgment. It's the final sentence of a truly horrific time. And then what happens? The last event on the timetable is the beginning of eternity. Of the new heaven and a new earth. The next chapter, chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. Skip down to verse 4. Wonderful time. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. A great promise as we see as we're concluding the book of Revelation, and eternity to live forever with God. Eternity will have just begun. So in recap, looking right up here, here are the eight events. The next event on God's timetable, the rapture of believers. All those who trust in Christ will meet the Lord in the air. And then for the seven years, there'll be the marriage supper line, the judgment seat of Christ. During that time, the seven years of tribulation, awful events for those who didn't accept Christ on earth. The conclusion of that, Jesus Christ comes back, sets up his millennial kingdom, reigns for a thousand years while Satan is bound. Then there's the final judgment of Satan. After the final judgment of Satan, there's the great white throne judgment. Where everyone who has not accepted Christ is cast into the lake of fire. And then there's the beginning of eternity. We've seen the reliability of God's promises. There's a focus on prophecy, and there's a fulfillment. Now we've looked at the revealing of God's program. What's going to happen next? That's what happened. I want us to think about this third of all. What's the response for God's people? What's our response now? That's what the Bible says. That's what's going to happen. We'll mark it down. It will happen. Our faith will become sight one day. What do we do about it today? What do you and I need to do about what we know about what the Bible says? Take your Bibles. Turn back a few pages. To Second Peter, Second Peter chapter three, right before Revelation is Jude, and then First, Second, Third John, and right before that is Second Peter, chapter three. Peter asks the same question that I just asked you. Let's look at it. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Bible says this: The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We'll keep going in just a moment, but he's making it very, very clear. The Lord wants everyone to accept him. God doesn't want to send anyone to the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. He wants everyone to accept him. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. How many times do you, you read a, a, a burglar comes to, to rob a house and the people who are there are ready? I mean, that only happens in Home Alone <laughs> where he's ready. That doesn't really happen. A burglar comes on a thief in the night when you don't know anything about it to catch you off guard. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come like that. Well, people aren't going to be prepared. In the which, verse 10, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then, watch verse 11, that all these things shall be dissolved. Here's the question. What manner of persons ought ye to be? Peter's asking here, 
God wants everyone to be saved because the truth of the matter is he's coming again one day. Whether people are ready or not, he's coming back. Because of this, what manner of persons ought you to be? How should you and I live? He was emphasizing that we should live differently because Christ is coming back. He's emphasizing that we should live a, a different kind of life because our faith is becoming, going to become sight one day. Because of these prophetic events that we talked about, we should live differently. What manner of persons ought you to be? I want to give you four quick things for you to take home with you this morning. First of all, His return provides a confidence in our hearts. The fact that Jesus Christ is coming back should provide a confidence in our hearts. You say, well, what do you mean? Verse number 13. The Bible says, Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God is not slack, verse 9 says, concerning His promise. And then verse 13. According to that promise, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. It can produce confidence because God's promises never fail. We won't turn there, but a few pages back in Titus 2, it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, if you look around in this world and you have any thoughts the same that I do, it's like, that's not fair. That's not right. How can people live so against God? It's not right. How can they they mock our God and, and do this and, and, and the country we live in? Oh my goodness, it's just we want nothing to do with God, but there's a confident a confidence that can be in your eye in our hearts. Because Jesus said, Hold on, <laughs> I'm coming again. And when I do, I'm settling all scores. I'm gonna make it all right. Even amongst other Christians, sometimes we think, man, how can they do that? How can they get away with that? It's just not right, and they're doing it in the name of the whole on. God says, I'm going to make it all right. I'm going to settle all scores. Sometimes we want to get revenge. I want to get revenge. Sometimes I want to make this right with somebody. But God says, you know what? Leave it up to me. I promise you I will. There's a confidence I can live with because he's coming back. It should provide a confidence in our heart. But second of all, his return should purify the conviction of my living. First, it provide a confidence in my heart. Next, it should purify a conviction in my living. Look at 2 Peter verse, in chapter 3, verse number 11 again. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? Here it is, in all holy conversation and godliness. The Bible says because these things are going to happen, we should have, first of all, a holy conversation. That means a lifestyle that's holy, and we should live godly. In fact, hold, hold your place there. Turn over to the next page. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John is the next page over. Chapter 3. Look at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him. What hope? The hope that Jesus is coming back. Every man that hath this hope in him, what does he do? Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. God says, if you know that I'm coming back and that's something that's in your heart, you're going to purify yourself. What manner of persons ought you, ought you to be? Holy conversation and godliness. The conviction of your life, why should, why, why should we live right? Why should we live holy? Does it even all matter? God says, if you're really believing that I'm coming back, it's going to change your conviction in your life. You're going to live in such a manner that recognizes that. Uh, I mentioned Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope. The very next verse says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself the peculiar people, zealous of good works. You and I should live holy, godly, because he's coming back. So it provides confidence. Purifies convictions, third of all, it promotes a consciousness for souls. Christ's return promotes a consciousness for souls. We saw in 2 Peter 3 that the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. 
The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to get to the point of the rapture and not be raptured. God doesn't want anyone, when he returns, to have not accepted him. The sad truth, though, is when that time happens, or when someone stands before the Lord at the great white throne judgment, here's the, here's the truth. The chances of salvation are over at that point. We can't wait for these things to occur and then say, okay, now I believe. The Bible tells us it's clearly too late. So for you and I, that should promote a consciousness to tell others. If you're like me, sometimes you may say it feels awkward. I get uncomfortable talking to someone. And I'll agree it's not easy all the time. It's not easy. But I try to compare the uncomfortable part of my life to the discomfort that someone else will face before Christ when they don't accept him. You say, you're trying to guilt us into telling others? No, I'm just saying, according to Scripture, if we believe that He's coming back, if we believe that He's going to do what He said, then we need to be telling others. You say, well, it's not just my job to tell others. The truth of the matter is, if you remember two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit goes before us anyway. Holy Spirit tells them, and we just meet up with them and show them what the Holy Spirit has been saying and accept Christ. Christ's return provides confidence in our hearts. Christ's return purifies the convictions of our life. Christ's return promotes a consciousness for souls. But last of all, Christ's return should produce a certainty in our priorities. A certainty in our priorities. Look there in 2 Peter 3 again. Verse number 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Watch what happens then. In the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. Notice the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. In other words, when Christ returns, we're not taking anything with us. Everything that we work so hard at, everything that we try to build up, all the treasures we try to amass and store will all be gone. We can't take it with us. So he's encouraging these people. Paul does the same in many different other uh, places in Scripture. That realign your priorities based on what's going to last. You know, not everything will be burned up. All our works will be burned up. But he had challenged them to invest their time, invest their energy, invest your resources into something that will stand the test of the judgment seat. The very last place we'll turn and we'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want you to see this, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We talked about the rapture, and after that, we stand before Christ. Where will we judge? We talked about the medal ceremony, so to speak, and the rewards that we receive. How do we know what's going to last? The Bible says it's going to be tried, good or bad. How do we know what's going to last? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12. The Bible says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, all that stuff's good. That sounds great. I wouldn't mind some gold. Silver. What's verse 13? Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. Here it is. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If a man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Here's the truth of the matter. You and I are going to stand before the Lord one day and give an account of how we live our lives. If you trusted Christ, we're going to have to give an account one day of how we have invested our lives. So right now, you and I have the opportunity to lay up treasures in heaven or to squander our lives away here on earth. That should motivate us. That should motivate us to realign our priorities. That, that should take how, how, that should make us take a hard look at our calendar. A hard look at our budget. 
That should make us take a hard look at our schedule. How about this? That should make us take a hard look at our relationships with others. Because God said, it's going to be tried by fire. Uh, and, and if it lasts fire, it will receive a sure reward. If not, it won't have anything to show for it. When the day comes as a thief in the night, our lives should be invested in eternity. It should provide a confidence in our heart. It should, it should purify our convictions, our living. It should promote a consciousness for souls, but it should produce a certainty in our priorities. The story is told of Sir Ernest Shackleton. He led a group of men in an expedition to Antarctica. And as he's there in, in the Antarctic, he leaves some of the men on what was called Elephant Island. And, and, and he had the intent, I'm coming back. I'm going to return for you. I'm going to carry you back to England. Well, there was one problem. When he went to go return, it got delayed. Uh, by the time he could go back for them, the sea had frozen. He had no access to the island. So he tried again and failed again. He tried again and failed again. Three times he failed, but on his fourth try, he finally broke through. He finally found the narrow channel that he could make it to the island. But after all that time, what do you think he found? Much to his surprise, he found those men packed up and waiting for him. Supplies were all packed up. They were ready to board. And they were soon on their way back to England. And he was confused. How in the world were you packed and ready for me to come? I, it had been so long. I had intended to come so long ago and, and all these delays. And I, how, how did this happen? And the men told him this. It's real simple. We were sure that you would return. Every morning, we got up, rolled up our bag, packed our gear, told the crew to do the same. Get your things ready, boys. The boss might come today. Simply told them we were ready every day for the day. We knew, you told us you were coming back. We just got ready. In the same way, you and I must be ready for Christ. We read in the very first passage of Scripture, he said, I will come again. Are you ready for your master's return? You see, don't be discouraged with the circumstances around you. Just apply the hope of his return. Don't be discouraged with how things seem to be not working out in life. Just remember God's coming back one day. If you're compromising in your daily living, in your daily lifestyle, purify yourself because of his return. If you're talking with people on a daily basis who don't know the Lord, tell them about Jesus because he's coming back and it might be too late for them. And if you're moving through your life with missed opportunities, uh, making it count for eternity, rearrange your priorities today. Why? He's coming back. We must be ready. If you trusted Christ, it should go in our lives. If you haven't trusted Christ, today's the day. He's coming back. Let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer.